Now, the outlook on the global economy and financial stability of governments around the world will be presented today in a widely watched press briefing at the IMF World Bank meetings in Washington, D.C. A mix of cost of living crisis, military aggression and the fight against inflation around the world will all be factored in as the IMF and World Bank give an assessment of 2024 in the rearview mirror and what lies ahead in 2025. Our Rise Business Correspondent Rotus Sadiri is in Washington, D.C. and joins us now. Good morning, Rotus. It's great to see you again, uh, much earlier at your end, I'm sure. Yes, indeed. Uh, good morning to you, Abby, and good morning to all our viewers. Yeah, it's about a five-hour difference uh, between, uh, you know, Washington, D.C. and Lagos, Nigeria. So, yep, about uh, 6.15, 6.16 a.m. this morning. Good to be with you. Great. Well, it's, it's very rainy in Lagos right now, so bear with all the noise you might hear in the background. Now, Rotus, for those who are still unsure of the distinction between the two, what differentiates the world economic outlook from the Global Financial Stability Report? Yeah, so um, with the global economic outlook, you're looking at GDP growth for different regions. So the developed economies, the developing economies, lower income economies, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, North, the Americas, North America, Central America, South. You've got Europe, Asia, Middle East, Africa, and so on and so forth. So it's a macro view as to the different trends need to each region and how all that comes together for the total outlook. So it's been tepid. We talked about this yesterday. You really talked about in your intro, military aggression, Israel, Gaza, uh, Russia, Ukraine, going into three years by February next year, inflation, debt, and the like. So that's all go be put together for the World Economic Outlook. The Global Financial Stability Report is a little more specific, a little more granular. Think about your, your, your personal financial stability as an individual. How much do you bring in in your salary versus how much you pay out in bills? If you're a business, how much in income or earnings do you make uh, every month versus how much you pay for power, salary, so on and so forth? So financial stability, this is taking a macro view for countries and nations. How much income are they bringing in? Uh, commodity dependent nations like Iran, Iraq or in Nigeria or Venezuela. Uh, how much are they uh, sell, putting out in terms of debt payments, interest and so on and so forth. Uh, and also essentially how that stacks up to the global financial system, cross border payments, financial inclusion and the like. So I, I like the fact that they've separated both of these reports uh, and not just, you know, put all of them together. It's, it's a good way to view what's going on in terms of finance, which is the life and blood of countries around the world. Absolutely, and very well put, Rotus. So what solutions will the IMF and the World Bank be putting forward to ensure a more solid global financial system? Well, Abby, it comes down to regions, right? If you are a developed market, then you're looking at, you know, cryptocurrencies, uh, cybercrime, uh, cross-border payments, and so on and so forth. Um, also, if you're a, a developed nation, central bank digital currencies, right? And also, and that's on the tech side, but there's also the, the fight against uh, inflation, all right? And how that impacts the citizens of your specific regions and their finances, right? Then you come to emerging markets, it's most mostly going to be about debt. It's mostly going to be about how much money, which is domiciled in foreign currencies that emerging markets do not create on their own, versus, their, you know, versus how much they're bringing in in income. So if you look at in Nigeria, on the front page of today's this day newspaper, Nigeria's newspaper of record, the Tinubu administration wants to ramp up oil and oil production by 1 million barrels over the next 12 months. Is that possible? Can that be done? And that links to the wider economy, right? Look at China, Abby. You've been reporting on China almost on a daily basis now for how many months? China needs to do well. Why? Because China is the largest consumer of oil. So if you're in Nigeria or you're in Libya or anybody that is commodity dependent, Yes, you want to ramp up your oil production, but if who you're going to sell it to if your demand is falling in a China and other parts of the world or India. So everything is interconnected. So if the, the glo global stability or financial stability is going to depend a lot, at least for emerging markets, to increase income. Yes, they were the super rich. You've got to increase your income, you've got to pay down your debt, and you've got to focus on productive ways to spend on infrastructure and the like that will bring you back returns that can pay forward going into the future. So it's a really delicate discussion for the different regions. Everybody's got their own unique challenges, but we'll be hearing a lot more in terms of those solutions from the IMF and the World Bank uh, later on today.
Right, and we look forward to that. So pretty much the multiplier, or dare I say, domino effect of how all these factors interrelate with each other. But Rodas, we understand the IMF's um, analytical corner will be looking at economic reforms and social inclusion. Can you tell us a bit more about that? I mean, that's another big, big topic, right? We've been reporting on this. If we look at Nigeria, Abby. I mean, the new administration that came in, the twin shocks, if you will, their economic shocks, but those were twin shocks that were precipitated by reforms, reforms to our um, exchange rates to liberalize it, reforms to the financial stability of Nigeria by reducing or try eliminating fuel subsidies. Those are reforms in order to stabilize finances so you can save money and use it for other things, education, healthcare. But the coin is that the people are paying more for fuel. Uh, they're also, if you are a manufacturer that is importing, you're also feeling the weight of a higher exchange rate and what it means for you being able to bring goods into the country. So forms their good sides and they also their impact. So what they're going to be talking about in the analytical corner is across the world, from Argentina to Nigeria to even the UK with Kia Starmer. We're going to get budget um, speech uh, from Rachel Reeves at the end of this month, which is not too far away. All these reforms that are being put in place, how are you able to impact the people? How are you able to be able to increase welfare um, for, for the people? We know that in the UK, for instance, they stopped those um, subsidies on winter fuel payments, right, to pensioners. So that's a reform that is meant to address the 22 billion pound sterling hole that the Labour Party said was left for them by the Tories. So from UK to Nigeria to Argentina, with Javier Millet, you know, doing this and that. All these reforms are able to people positively. The key thing to remember is that every reform is like a bitter pill you have to swallow, right? It's like medicine, you've got to, bitter medicine. You have to allow it to cause your it will be discomfort and pain, but then going forward in the long run, are you better off? So a lot of that is going to be discussed at that um, analytical corner. Uh, Lisa this morning. Right, I like the analogy of the bitter pill. It, it certainly is. Well, it sounds like a lot is going on today. I mean, we also know that there's a session uh, featuring the Gulf Cooperation Council. Now, we know that this council has got seven Gulf member states, but what really is its core function and what will they be discussing today? Yeah, so the Gulf Cooperation Council, as you said, uh, it's an intergovernmental, political, regional, economic union of Gulf states. So you've got Bahrain, you've got Oman, you've got Qatar, you've got Kuwait, you've got Saudi Arabia, and you've got the United Arab Emirates. And what they're going to be talking about is sovereign wealth funds and the impact that sovereign wealth funds have on diversification. So sovereign wealth funds, of course, are a fund like a savings account for a country. You put money away. Like Think about Nigeria's excess crude account. So our benchmark um, oil price is $77.96. Oil prices are still where they are, but if they were to go over, every additional dollar above your benchmark goes into the excess crude account, which can then be used for you know, sovereign wealth or whatever it is. So for the Gulf states in particular, they are on a diversification path. We all know that they all sell oil. From your Look at Qatar at the last World Cup was able to fund an entire World Cup with oil wealth. We know about Saudi Arabia, Oman, and so on and so forth, Bahrain, and so on and so forth. So so what they'll be talking about today is, listen, these sovereign wealth funds, this money that we're putting away, how are we able to effectively deploy these funds to diversify away from dependence on fossil fuels? So Saudi Arabia is trying to build a smart city where you've got roads that charge electric cars as they drive. Qatar is also trying to diversify away from oil. So, I mean, they'll still depend on oil, but effectively, how do you deploy these funds, you know, in order to be able to increase your revenues that if we connect it back to the global financial stability report, are able to diversify the income streams of these um, respective uh, countries. So that again, as, as you said, really packed the has to be another uh, big decision or big uh, discussion point for those Gulf nations. Right. You're going to have to split yourself quite, quite a number of ways today, Rotas. But finally, we also understand that Nigeria's finance minister, Wali Edun, will participate in a G24 press briefing. What can we expect from this one? Yeah, so uh, it's chaired by the Secretary of Finance for the Philippines, Ralph Recto. Uh, I think the Undersecretary for the Ministry of Economy, uh, Finance Ministry in Argentina, uh, is going to be uh, there as well, the co-chair. Raleigh Edu as well. So these are finance ministers. The G24, I think, established back in 1971 or so. Uh, Nigeria is a member, Algeria, Ghana, China, Ecuador, and so on and so forth. The So how much are these countries able to bring in in terms of financial, uh, foreign direct investment? Look at what Argentina and Nigeria mirror images of each other with Javier Millet. 
coming in, uh, having to you know put in painful reforms just like Nigeria. So for the finance minister of Argentina, how can you, a P24 member, bring in funds into your region? Same thing for the Philippines, same thing for uh, Nigeria. I think that's an invitation only um, discussion that's going to be going on today. We'll try to get in and see if we can get a few words from the respective ministers. But that's mostly with those finance ministers. How much are you bringing in? Uh, Wale Edu, I think it was what, two, three weeks ago, we're reporting on him saying that he wants to have single digit interest rates in Nigeria so people can afford mortgages. Well, in order to do that, you have to have a liquid mortgage market. And in order to have a liquid mortgage market, you got to bring in money from somewhere. So you have to have effective policy that is going to attract FDI to allow address healthcare, mortgages, uh, and so on and so forth. So across the different regions, they will be, they'll be discussing that as well. And we, that, that should be another interesting topic uh, today. Right. Very important questions there. And Rotis, we're rooting for you to get in there. So um, thanks as always for the insightful updates. We'll see you again very soon.